I'm here in Houston, Texas, just a few minutes away from my podcast studio, and by coincidence, Perry is building the biggest residential printed house in the world right here. It's even bigger than the house they did in Germany and much more impressive. They've learned a lot from their many projects and they're implementing their new skills on this job site with all kinds of architectural details that we'll get into in a minute. This project is still under construction. They have lots of printing left to do in addition to some timber frame construction and all of the finishings. Perry has kindly agreed to let me film the process multiple times, so I'll certainly be stopping back. Make sure to subscribe and hit the notification bell so you don't miss the updates on this awesome home. Big shout out to the Perry team for their openness and transparency. Not every team is so willing to let people film their projects, especially while they're under construction. This home is pushing the boundaries. Many of the homes that people don't let me film have things to hide. Always be wary of any 3D printed construction company that limits the filming at their facility. It's likely because they want to control what you can and can't see from their project. My favorite part of this house is they didn't just go for four simple walls, they really pushed the limits of what 3D printed construction is capable of. And that's important because when you're using a new technology, it's better to do something that's impossible without it rather than just trying to copy things that people have done with older technologies in the past. My name is Fabian Meyerblutz. I'm responsible here at Perry for all our 3D printing activities and I'm the director of Perry 3D Construction Inc. in the United States as well as the CEO of Perry 3D Construction in Germany. What we're very excited about in this project is definitely the design of it as well as how we've been integrating it into a hybrid system so it's not just the concrete but it will be combined with timber frame construction in certain portions of the building as well so that we've really taken the perspective of the overall construction process and how to make this exciting. An example of what we mean with hybrid construction, concrete is very good in being structural so here we see one of the structural close support columns that we're going to be using um, but in between where we have non-structural elements we're going to be using uh, wood frame construction to fill that in. Um, another thing that is exciting here is that we are combining printed in situ with prefabricated parts so here we see two pieces of the chimney that are going to be put up here to make a overall 40 foot tall structure um, at the end of the construction cycle. What is always very important to us is how we integrate all the trades in this building which we've done together with CIV the contractor and Hannah the designer for example that we're integrating the power outlets directly into the print so while the concrete is still wet we're cutting out little sections and putting in those power outlets. At the same time, you can still mold uh, parts of the printed concrete while it is wet. And this gives us a nice surface in which we can include the door that's going to come in here later. And this is very important for the overall time frame and cost structure of the building. As with every other project, we're still in the learning phase here. It's still a young technology. Um, so for example, here we have a couple of details where we had to cut out a little bit of the concrete because it wasn't quite perfect um, for the power outlet. Um, these are things that we're learning here going from section to section where we're going to try to speed up the process. We're happy in this project compared to others is uh, the layer quality that we've been able to produce. We've been uh, using uh, live sensor measurements to be sure that every layer is always perfect, not just for the visual aesthetics of it, but also for the quality assurance of the structural integrity of the structure. Um, and this is what, what we're always looking for, and particularly in such a high-end project. We've implemented a lot of the learnings from past projects. So for example, here in the blistering heat of the Texas sun, um, we, we sectioned the building accordingly. So we have a back section of the building where we see the first story being printed already. We've also printed then in separate sections the previous cast elements. And the building is going to go on and progress, and again, being sections in, in, in different parts. Um, this uh, gives us, with the quick read material, exactly the right layer time that we need also to avoid the, the cracking. Here we see these chimney precast elements from the top. Um, they have been filled with, with the rebar and conventional concrete in order to give them the structural integrity that we need to lift them up. Um, otherwise, it, they are very heavy parts and uh, given this we need the rebar. I'm Sam Hager. I'm the head of engineering uh, for the US division of Perry 3D Construction. On this job, I'm responsible for the printer operations, so I take care of the CAD files, the file slicing, um, the actual printing operation. You can see I have my little setup here. Um, this is my first time doing a two-story house, so things are a little bit trickier because I'm not able to directly see. So this project, we've started implementing sensors and cameras, things that I wish I had in my previous projects. So I'm able to monitor 
roughly the water to cement ratio, um, get an idea of the quality of the material before it extrudes from the nozzle. I'm also able to have a live view of the print head, so I'm able to see roughly where I'm at in the print plan. Also over to my left, I'll always keep the print file slice open so I can get an idea of how many layers are left in the day, um, kind of our progress, what happens if we this project, we have a lot of lintel overhangs, um, interesting architects and geometry. So a lot of times I'll be here on the walkie talkie and give someone a heads up like, hey, we are two layers off from our, our next geometry change. So making sure our printer or our print manager or construction manager is aware they can lay down lintels or backfill or whatever other little things they might need to do, they will have a clear heads up. Everything else is controlled through this interface. Um, we can do it remotely, so through Wi-Fi. I can walk around with an iPad or I can have it just right here on the computer in front of me. Generally, I'll be seated here because um, it's quite hot and bright and um, we'll have our construction manager walking around controlling, giving me feedback if anything's happening. But it's, it's really nice to have three-way communication between the material production, uh, the printer operation, and then the construction management. So last summer, I was project lead for a project we did in Tempe, Arizona. And we are one year removed from then, and I believe we've become much better, um, mainly with material production. So in general, the most important part of a successful 3D printing project is having nice, high-quality material consistent throughout the duration of the project. And so we've spent the time from the when that project ended to when we begin here really overhauling and taking a look at how we can better create more consistent material, um, even in hot conditions like we have down here in Houston. So in Arizona, we learned a lot. Um, it was easily getting up to 120 degrees during a print day, which is quite challenging. So now we are using chilled water. So instead of the roughly 70 degree tap water that comes out of the, uh, the groundwater, we, I think we're down to about 35 degrees, which really gives us a lot more leeway in terms of controlling the consistency and the quality of the material. Beyond that, um, our, our communication between the printer operator and the material production um, is, is much better. We're able to use a variety of other technologies to keep an eye on the material, the pressure that we have across the hose, um, just a, a wide array of different um, feedbacks through sensors and things like that that's able to tell us more about the material that's coming out of the printhead that we did not have in the past. So we also had a lot of interesting things in terms of sectioning. So what you're seeing behind me here are two precast elements that are going to get lifted into place. This is actually the top of our chimney. So we are printing up to a roughly 21 feet just on the normal part of our house. And then both of these 10 foot one uh, walls or chimney sections will be lifted by crane to create a, uh, I think roughly 40 foot, 42 foot tall chimney, which will be quite exciting. It'll be a nice, interesting architectural feature. But beyond that, instead of having to chop the house, generally we will do the left side of the house and the right side of the house for a larger house and bump back and forth between the days. Uh, but with this project, it's such a large footprint, it's almost 4,000 square feet. To section the different walls would be quite difficult and interesting. Um, so instead, we have five separate monolith walls that have clear separation from each other. So this is where we are ended, ending section one. Um, the next print will actually be where those chimney sections were. And we will slowly move our printer down the house, printing up to 10 foot, then 20 foot, finish all the insulation grouting, move the printer down, and repeat the process. This allows us to have really tight control of our layer times, and uh, we're able to actually get more vertical height per day because we can print faster, have lower layer times, which means higher vertical growth, and it will, over the course of the project, actually reduce the amount of time we'll be here on site. Actually, another precast element. So this is gonna be the front side of the fireplace. So if you look over here, this is where the actual fireplace unit will go. We're gonna be putting um, electrical outlets at the top of those. So if you look over here, um, we have these little cutouts. This is where we installed some of the electronics, but this piece will get picked up and pushed against that wall. So these, in the end, will actually be hidden. You won't be able to see it, and you'll still be able to plug in a TV or something like that through the 3D printed concrete. And we have things like that all throughout our house. Uh, 
you see light switches, outlets. On top of here, we have uh, outlets again for uh, upward facing lights. So we had really thoughtful design of how we are doing both our plumbing, our electrical, our structural elements, and our insulation. Um, one really interesting thing about this house is there will be no concrete that touches both the outside and the inside. So we have a perfect thermal gap all the way throughout the house. So you can see this is this is just spray foam out of a can to seal this, but behind we have a continuous line of insulative material that will separate the, the outside world, which here in Houston it gets quite hot, from uh, the nice cool inside. So we really wanted to think about how can we keep a house this size made out of this material cool for longer and try to utilize the, the, the thermal mass. Um, so you have a lot of, if, if something starts cold overnight, there's, it's so massive that it'll take a lot longer for the heat to creep up to then where you need to kick on your air conditioning and cool it back down. A couple choices with this house, um, one of which we wanted our 3D printed wall to almost disappear underground. So these layers are actually gonna be underneath uh, the graded earth um, when we finish the project. So it'll look like the 3D printed wall just disappears right into the ground. How that got interesting is you can only print the whole layer all at once. You can't necessarily print the outside wall up to a certain height and then the inside. The house is built in consistent layers. That's why I was mentioning um, having control over layer times is so important. But one of those things is we would need to match this layer height exactly to a layer height over here. So it did take a little uh, bit of finagling and trickiness to be able to get up to that perfect height. Also, no foundation is ever perfectly flat. Um, unless you 3D print the outer form, then um, you can get away with a perfectly flat foundation. But back corner of the house, it maybe deviates about a, a half inch to a quarter of an inch compared to here. This is a bit of a local high point. So we need to compensate with our first layer printed on slab. We'll be a little bit taller and um, a different look than the rest of the house. So you can see where this first layer makes up with what we printed here before. There's a little bit of waviness. Um, there's ways to mitigate that overall, but beyond that, I'm, I'm very happy with the uh, material and the print layer quality we've been able to manage. A lot of people will opt to print with smoothing flaps. So as you print, the flaps will smooth out the outside of the wall. But we have so many overhangs and step overs. If you're printing with flaps, when you then step over for the next layer, the flaps will dig into the layer you printed below. And uh, so that's why with this project, we opted to print without flaps. Show off the, we call it the, the pancake look, because it looks like a bunch of pancakes stacked on top of each other. Um, but in my opinion, it's quite interesting, it's quite beautiful. And even from a distance, if you're driving down the road, you can look over your shoulder and notice, hey, this house is different, there's something going on with it. Um, it's not what you would traditionally see here in Houston, which 99% of houses are traditional wood frame construction. And uh, that's what we're trying to kind of innovate away from. Uh, what we feel is important about such uh, disruptive technology and the way that it moves into the market um, is I really like to make a comparison here to, to LED lamps. So LED lamps have been invented decades ago. Um, then we've seen them in, for example, the medical field. And then it took another couple of decades until we can buy them for just a couple of bucks at the hardware store. Um, and I think the same thing will be true for 3D printing. It has this huge potential to disrupt the technology, uh, the, the whole industry. It can be applied already today for exciting projects as this one. Um, and as we go and grow and learn, we will be able to, to bring it out to the masses and make it more affordable and more sustainable and faster. Um, but we're not quite there yet. We need, we need this, this little bit of, of additional learning and additional time to make it happen. In projects like this, we're also always very happy to have students and interns involved so that we can share our knowledge uh, in the wider construction industry and train up the next generation of the construction workers. Uh, very happy to have some colleagues on board for the US team. My name is Hector. Uh, I used to be a 3D printing intern at Perry and now I'm a sales engineer for Perry. My name is Oscar. I recently joined the Perry 3 construction team as an engineer. Stay tuned for updates on this awesome project and check out some of the other videos I've done of 3D printed houses around the world. If you're curious, they used a quick create material for this print. Tomorrow I'll be stopping by the site again for a media day to interview their architect, someone from Quick Crete, and some other team members that will be in attendance.